Thank you everyone for coming. We are waiting just a few more minutes and then we will get going with COVID-19, the immune system and traditional foods with instructor Linda Black Elk. This is First Foods, a new day for old ways. And for the folks just joining, I've put up Linda's bio. And before we get going, I'll just read it for you while we wait for everyone else to join. So Linda Black Elk is an ethnobotanist specializing in teaching about culturally important plants and their uses as food, medicine, and materials. Linda works to build curriculum and ways of thinking that will promote and protect food sovereignty traditional knowledge and environmental quality as an extension of the fight against hydraulic fracturing and the fossil fuels industry. Okay, so we will get going and I will continue to admit people into the class. Uh, first up, we have Brooke Rodriguez. She is the program uh, manager and director. Um, Brooke, if you wanted to maybe introduce yourself, please. Hi, so my Hi. name is Brooke uh, Kiahani Rodriguez. I am with the Taino Nation. And I just wanted to welcome everybody for coming to our first live feed regarding First Foods. We are a basically a program that started up with indigenous um, chefs, cooks, foragers, and survivalists wanting to come together and kind of share with urban natives in New York City. But during the whole COVID, that um, program kind of had to get switched pretty quickly on to a more digital platform to reach people. But in some ways, it worked out a little bit better because we were able to connect with so many more um, native people and culture bearers and so first foods is a program that we really want to be able to one to one provide opportunity to indigenous people to teach their own food systems to other indigenous, to other indigenous people, people primarily people primarily and focus on topics varying from breast milk to food sovereignty to um different cultural uh, cuisines and, and cooking demos and of that nature I don't know, uh, Desiree, you want to maybe add to what First Foods is and what we're trying to do before we get into some of our protocols that we established? Sure. Um, you just this, everybody. My name is Desiree Kane. I'm a Miwok to Spirit living in occupied Arapaho territory in Colorado. Uh, First Foods is a program that is sponsored by Ibex Puppetry. Um, it is focusing on, like Brooke said, things like food sovereignty, our relationship with food as medicine. We have a bunch of programs coming up in the next two months between seeds, seed saving, soil health. Next week, we've got foraging, harvesting, and storytelling with a culture bearer named Isaac Murdoch. And after that, we've got Emma Elliott, who is going to be doing a cooking demonstration for us and how to make cedar and sage teas. So that's who we are. <laughs> Thank you for coming to our very first First Foods class. Um, I'm gonna put up the class schedule one more time so everyone can see it. The one that we're on now is May 7th, COVID-19, the immune system and traditional foods. I just mentioned Isaac Murdoch, you can see on the second one. And there you can see Emma Elliott um, and her program. So uh, first for protocols, we're gonna start with a land acknowledgement, which means that we recognize, uphold, and respect native nations and their life ways above all else as the ruling governance of Turtle Island. 
everyone attending this space must please uphold the same. The second. Yeah. Yeah. So just to speak a little bit more on that, this is especially for people who are in this space as guests and who are settlers. You must understand that these are stolen lands and there are still people that um, have been removed, displaced, and they're still residing on traditional lands if they haven't been removed and displaced. And we still need to understand that land acknowledgement is not just a statement, it's an ideology and it's an action. So what we're requiring of people who come to the space is that they're respectful of the territories that they're in and that they see and understand that the true governing body in the government is the ancestral territories and nations that were there or that are currently there. So it's just really important for non-natives to understand that there are protocols and formalities in Indian country that haven't been upheld and it, we find it quite disrespectful. And so we, we want to open the space with an understanding that, you know, when you're here, you have to understand that there's a history. So yes, we'll share information, knowledge, but there's a history of oppression for us and that includes our first food systems. Okay, so for the second protocol, we have native knowledge. Lessons learned are not for non-natives to monetize on or repackage as their own. Native knowledge systems belong to the cultural communities they come from and to the guest teachers in our programming. Brooke, did you want to speak on that? I feel like you maybe just went over that. Yeah, just, just reiterating the same things. They, the knowledge that you learn from these teachers is supposed to be respected. They are the um, keepers of this knowledge. And that doesn't mean that you go on and take it and monetize like Desiree has said. And to understand that these knowledge systems that they have come from a long uh, intergenerational history. So they're learning it from their grandparents and great-grandparents and so it, it's a cultural knowledge and I think we live in a system that's very capitalistic and that we think that oh well if the knowledge is being shared through zoom or or anything like that 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 means that oh now I have an ownership of that and so what we want to make sure is that people understand that no you don't have an ownership to that who owns that knowledge is the traditional people that comes from Okay. The third one, foraging and harvesting. Always seek permission from tribal communities to forage and harvest. These medicines or foods may be seasonal and being left to replenish themselves. Also respect if the answer is no. Okay. The fourth one and final one is food sovereignty. First people have the rights to hunt, fish, forest, forage and harvest in their traditional territories. And it is unacceptable to critique traditional or contemporary dietary styles as a non-native. So I'll hand it back off to you, Brooke. That is the last of our protocols. So just a little so just a little backtrack on foraging and harvesting um a lot of the plant medicines we have are our relatives and they have their own spirits and seasons and their ceremonies around that and you know it goes back not only to that but also to land acknowledgement you need to be asking do i have permission to harvest do i have permission to forage is it the season am i over harvesting am i being disrespectful to not only the indigenous people from that territory or the First Nations from that territory, but am I being disrespectful to the plants themselves by over harvesting? So you just wanna make sure, are you following protocol? Are you following proper formalities? And the same goes with the uh, food sovereignty. Indigenous people have the right as first people to you know, partake in, in our food systems the way we see uh, fit and how we choose to govern those food systems is only up to the nation. Um, so, you know, whatever, Desiree is Miwok, so it's, it's Desiree's decision, you know, as a Miwok person in Miwok territory, how those food systems should be uh, managed or handled. And for, for someone like myself, who's Taino, if I'm back home in the islands, it is our decision collectively, and non-natives are not really allowed to comment on those things, unless, you know, given permission by the community. Everything about is, 
is about consent, really. All right, so we'll, thank you. We'll get into Linda's programming. I'm gonna put her bio up one more time for everybody to read. Okay, so Linda Black Elk is an ethnobotanist specializing in teaching about culturally important plants and their uses as food medicine and materials. Linda works to build curriculum and ways of thinking that will promote and protect food sovereignty, traditional plant knowledge, and environmental quality as an extension of the fight against hydraulic fracturing and the fossil fuels industry. So we're going to play a little video for you so you can learn a little bit about Linda and we will go straight into her introduction as soon as that video is ended. And here we go. I am an ethnobotanist and I have been working with the sacred stone camps from the very beginning. I have seen the absolute wealth of incredible medicinal and edible plants that are right there in the path of that pipeline. And so um, I could see what was getting destroyed. To a lot of people, as they drive by, they might just think, oh, it's just grass. It's not just grassland. There are sacred medicines there, such as echinacea and gustafolia. In Lakota, they call it ichachbehu. And um, it's a beautiful medicine that you can use uh, anytime you're sick to boost your immune system. It's great for sore throats and toothaches. Um, it's probably one of the top 10 most important medicines of the Lakota people. And there are literally thousands of them getting bulldozed by Dakota Access every day. This is just devastating. When I pray, I actually apologize to the plants. And you know, plants have spirit. They're a nation in and of themselves. And um, I apologize to them for not doing enough to protect them. Um, for not doing enough to protect them to this point. But I know that we can stand up now. We are stronger than ever. And we know that, that the foundation of this entire movement is on us. It is on our shoulders as women. I need to stand up and walk with power and hope just like I was meant to. All right, so that was the video about Linda. Linda, um, welcome to First Foods. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so excited um, to be here with you guys and um, to talk to you a little bit about something that I love. I'm really grateful um, for my life because it just so happens that my job, the work I do, is also um, my hobby. Um, but working with plants isn't just a hobby. It's not just an academic venture, although I am trained um, as a Western scientist. Um, I, uh, these, these plants um, are my relatives. They're my friends. They're my allies. Um, they are who I go to. These, these plants are who I go to um, when I have an issue um, or when someone else might have an issue. And um, I just want to say that very often, and I think that th this is really important before we really get into our discussion today, um, and that is that Western uh, science and Western medicine really thinks of illness as being a physical issue, right? Um, you go in and they give you um, a pill or something to cover up or um, relieve the symptoms. They don't really look at you as an entire person. Um, whereas indigenous medicine, indigenous people, we recognize the fact that illness is just as much mental, emotional, and spiritual as it is physical. And very often um, when we are ill mentally, emotionally, spiritually, it will manifest itself physically. So, um, uh, or vice versa. So um, I just wanted to say that. But yeah, I am Linda Black Elk. I um, am uh, Duca and Catawba, uh, but I live on occupied Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, Ocheti, Shakomi, and Mandan territory. Um, I've 
grew, I grew up here. I've lived here um, over half my life. And um, my children and my um, partner are all Lakota. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and get started unless Brooke or Desiree, you guys have anything else you want to say? Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and get started then. So um, we are going to talk today a little bit about the immune system. Um, of course, we can't have a webinar without talking about COVID-19. And um, we're going to relate that back, not only to the immune system, but we're going to relate that forward to how um, traditional foods and good foods in general uh, can help um, boost our immune system and keep us healthy in these difficult times, um, really difficult times for a lot of people. I, um, I personally know a lot of people who are sick and um, I've been treating them. So, um, and, and I've actually been treating uh, three people who um, were diagnosed uh, with COVID-19 and they're doing, all three of them are doing really well. So just to give you that little bit of background about myself. Um, and we will have time at the end for questions. But first I wanted to start off by talking about the immune system. What does that even mean? What does, what does it mean to boost your immune system? So first of all, your immune system is this, um, it's, it's a system within your body uh, where your organs, various cells and proteins work together to keep you healthy work together specifically to get rid of or attack um, foreign, um, foreign microbes that come into your body. Um, you have a lot of immune uh, immunity cells, cells that fight illness, um, where your tonsils are, okay? You have a lot of them in your gut. You even have a lot of them in your genitals. Right, so if something um, happens to where um, you get foreign microbes <laughs> or destructive microbes, um, uh, it, it, like if you if you inhale through your mouth and you get um, you you inhale a virus, immediately your body, those organs, those cells, those proteins will go to attack that virus and try to keep you healthy. Now, viruses are really tough. They replicate very quickly. Western science is kind of weird. As an indigenous person, as an indigenous scientist, I definitely feel that viruses are alive. And if you guys have ever seen what a virus looks like, they almost look like little spiders or robots. They're actually really freaky looking. Um, that was something, an image I actually forgot to have you put up, Desert because uh, viruses are actually uh, really crazy to look at. There are a lot of different kinds. But um, uh, they, Western science says they're not alive because they do not, um, they don't reproduce. Um, they replicate, but they do not reproduce. Yes. So, so, um, um, so it's so really it's important to say, to, to know what a virus is. A virus is very different from a bacteria. Okay, and um, COVID-19 is actually caused, that's an illness that's caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, this virus is, it replicates very quickly. It is incredibly contagious. Um, and we are finding, research that's being done very quickly on this virus is finding that one of the best ways that we can stay healthy, even if we get um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and become ill with COVID-19, um, one of the best ways we can combat that is with a high, a, a good, strong immune system and with really good food. They're absolutely, all the research that has been done so far is really reflecting that fact, okay? And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about um, how you can uh, keep your immune system high and healthy and strong and different foods to do that. Um, first, I want to say that it's really important right now, no matter where you live. Um, I am right now in a small apartment in um, one of the largest cities in North Dakota. Now, mind you, I know some of you guys are from huge cities like New York, 
and um, the entire state of North Dakota does not have as many people as Queens. So <laughs> I, I understand that I come from a small place, but um, I live in a small apartment and I have a lot of food growing. So um, I'm, I'm here to tell you that you can grow your own food, no matter where you're living, no matter how inexperienced you are, you can absolutely grow your own food. Um, if you know, you can ask around for seeds, there are seeds all over the place. One of my favorite companies to order seeds is Baker Creek heirloom seeds. Um, because they have a lot of different heirloom varieties. And that means uh, these are vi varieties of seeds that have not been overly hybridized. They have not been genetically modified and they've been passed down in families and tribes for hundreds and thousands of years, some of these seeds. Um, some tribes have actually shared their seeds with, with Baker Creek. They're a pretty reputable company. There are a lot of indigenous seed companies that I prefer to use, but they don't actually sell their seeds. Um, it's only by trade. And we could put together a list of those um, uh, seed companies, indigenous owned seed companies, if you guys want to afterward. So I just want to, um, first of all, say that it is extremely important that you grow your own food. If you only grow one tomato plant in a pot on your porch, or um, uh, you know, in a, in grow some herbs, like get some small flower pots and grow some basil and oregano and thyme in the window of your um, apartment or your RV if you're living in an RV. Um, you know, uh, that's that's a huge step towards food sovereignty. Okay, so um, uh, growing your own food is really important. I grow my own food but I also am a gatherer, a forager. So I go out and I harvest a lot of really amazing wild foods. And when I say food is medicine, that, that phrase has become really uh, overused, I feel like these days. A lot of people are saying, oh, food is medicine. Everyone's saying that. But I take that very literally. So for example, um, yesterday I was out harvesting, and some of you might recognize these. This is, in English, it's called a ramp, or some people call them wild leeks, or some people, um, I found, uh, like a lot of my Ojibwe friends up in northern Minnesota and Wisconsin call these wild onions. Um, wild onions, um, Desiree, if you have a picture of ramps that you want to put up, here's um, what they look like live, but I believe Desiree has a picture. Yep, it's a and they're growing. So large, wide leaves. Now, how do you identify those when you're outside? A lot of people are afraid they're going to get onions, wild onions, wild leeks, even wild garlic mixed up with other plants. But here's the thing. Nothing smells like an onion or a garlic or any of that onion family except an onion. If it looks like an onion or a leek or garlic and it smells like that, you're fine. Okay, and that's actually um, that family, the, the onions and the garlics and the leeks, um, as long as they have that strong, pungent, spicy smell and they look like an onion, <laughs> you're fine. Okay, so um, the, the, the thing is, and the reason why I'm talking about these, and can you show the wild onion, the Allium textile as well? Yeah. I'll actually use scientific names as well. So um, uh, these wild leeks, are Allium trichocum, okay? The wild onion, the textile onion, which is actually the one that grows here in the Dakotas where I live, um, that is the primary onion that grows here. And um, the, the two of them are brother and sister. You could hear they have the same first name, right? Allium trichocum, the ramps, Allium textile, that wild onion there. Um, and, but here's the thing. Any of those, the wild onions, the wild garlic, the wild leeks, are um, all fantastic for your lungs, okay? They're also amazing for your heart, by the way. They lower cholesterol, they thin blood, but what they do very often also is thin mucus. In fact, um, I remember when I was really little, my grandma, I had a lot of lung congestion. I'm asthmatic and I um, had a lot of lung congestion. I had um, caught a cold and um, to thin the mucus, she just sliced up 
store-bought onions and did a poultice on my chest. I think I was like five or six years old. Um, and she did a poultice on my chest. And if any of you guys have ever eaten onions or if you um, take a bite of, um, um, of, of, you know, like a wild onion, you'll kind of notice that your eyes start to water a little and that your nose starts to run. And that's because um, uh, the, the compounds in the wild onions will actually thin mucus and thin um, your secretions. So um, that's really good if you have lung congestion. Even just an onion poultice is really amazing for lung congestion. If it's um, someone with really thin or sensitive skin, wrap the onions up in a little bit of um, flannel or cloth so that it doesn't um, touch their skin directly because sometimes those things can be very hot and um, you want to be careful with that. Um, you know what else thins mucus and um, uh, you know that you can can use. I remember actually um, one time I went to the doctor with a friend and she had a sinus infection and I told her, you don't have to go to the doctor for that. I can help you out with that. And I tried to get her to eat a jalapeno for her sinus infection. And she laughed at me and she said I was crazy. So the crazy thing is when we got to the doctor's office, I drove her there, she went in, she, she had such a horrible sinus infection that she had big black rings under her eyes. And every time she would bend forward, it was, um, she had horrible pain, you know, from the pressure in her head. Um, and the doctor said to her, well, taking an antibiotic for a sinus infection will only make you well one day sooner. You only get better one day faster with an antibiotic for sinus infection. He said it's almost useless and it's an overuse and abuse of antibiotics. He said, you know what you need to do instead? Take a shot of Tabasco. <laughs> so um, even he was trying to tell her that little spicy hot chilies, these are dried Thai chilies. And if you've ever had Thai chilies before, you know they are extremely spicy. Um, I don't know how many Scovilles these are, but it's pretty high. Um, but I will actually soak these in vinegar with some other um, spices, which I'll talk about in a second, to make fire cider. Have you guys ever heard of fire cider? If you want to thin mucus, keep your lungs healthy, lower your blood pressure, um, keep your gut healthy with some good vinegar, um, what else does it do? Fire cider does such a multitude of things and you can find a thousand recipes for fire cider online. Um, I'm really more talking, I'm, I'm giving an overview of immunity, boosting your immune system and things like that today. I'm not really talking about specific recipes, but fire cider, you can find a million recipes online. And the fact is, just use what you have in your kitchen. You don't have to like go out and, um, I, I had a friend who thought she had to go out and buy some really fancy, um, you know, peppers or really fancy vinegar or whatever to make her fire cider. Use what you have. If you don't have raw organic apple cider vinegar, that's one of my favorite things. But if you don't, um, definitely, you know, use what you have. So fire cider is really fantastic. Um, it has hot chilies, it has onions, it has garlic, um, it has ginger, ginger root. I think you have a picture of ginger, um, don't you, Des? Yep, here you go. Yep, and, and so um, Sophia, that's such a, I'm, I'm really appreciative of you for saying that. I, it's actually, um, sorry, I go off on tangents sometimes. So what I was, what I, so one thing I was saying is that it's always really important to know the difference between a virus and a bacteria because um, viruses are very different than bacteria. Antibiotics will kill bacteria, they will not kill viruses. So people who are trying to say that you need to go on antibiotics to treat COVID-19 are, are crazy. Now. COVID-19 can cause a bacterial lung infection, right? A bacterial pneumonia. But what they're finding is that it's much more often a viral pneumonia. And antibiotics will not do bunk for the lung infection that, that you're getting. So um, 
So yes, absolutely avoiding antibiotics and the overuse of antibiotics is essential, especially um, you know, uh, if we're gonna prevent antibi antibiotic resistance. Um, so, okay, how do you, um, you, we know what our immune system is. It's this, you know, these organs and these proteins and these cells working together um, to kill foreign invaders that come into your body, to destroy these foreign invaders, right? Um, like I said, you inhale a virus, you um, maybe accidentally touch, right? This is the most common way to get any coronavirus, even the common cold, is you touch something, oops, oh, sorry. <laughs> you, you touch something that uh, someone who's sick has touched. And then what do you do? Have you guys ever counted the number of times per day that you accidentally touch your face? Maybe you bite your thumbnail when you're reading or watching TV. Maybe you pick your nose. <laughs> maybe you just even rub your nose like that. Or maybe you, like me, are always like adjusting your eye makeup or whatever. Whatever it is, um, we touch our face thousands of times a day. That is how these foreign invaders get into our system. Okay, and that is why it is so essential to keep our immune system high and to keep our immune system strong so that we can fight all those foreign invaders, um, virus, whether it's a virus or a bacteria, but we're talking about viruses right now, um, that enter our system. And we do it, we do it to ourselves. Um, they, can, they can enter through any of our orifices, so be really careful. Um, I worked with a microbiologist who said it's just important to wash, just as important to wash your hands before you use the bathroom as it is to wash them afterwards <laughs> because you can introduce viruses and bacteria into your system that way. So just throwing that out there. Okay, so keeping our immune system strong is um, uh, really important. And um, I was talking about fire cider as being one way to boost your immune system. It, if you don't like spicy foods, obviously fire cider is probably not the thing for you, but it is wonderful for thinning the mucus that's caused by a lot of these viral illnesses, whether it's influenza or a coronavirus. Um, so I love the spicy fire cider. It also has a lot of culinary applications. Um, so uh, whether you are eating, um, you know, like I put a little bit of fire cider on my bean soup. I put it on my greens because I, I eat a lot of greens. Um, I use fire cider in salad dressings um, or, you know, what we, what we did, and Desiree, you probably remember this, what we did at camp is we'd just take shots of fire cider every day to keep our immune system strong and to keep our lungs clear. Fantastic stuff. Um, if you are prone to sinus infections, fire cider is wonderful for you. Um, another uh, culinary preparation, but also something really wonderful um, that I use to keep my immune system strong. And um, it, it's, for me, it's one of the most potent antivirals around. And that is elderberry elixir. Again, you can find thousands of recipes for elderberry elixir online. Elderberries are cool little, oh, Desiree, you actually have a picture of elderberry, I believe. Yeah, so exactly. that up. This is what an elderberry um, bush looks like. Um, uh, you can see the berries there. They're actually very tiny. Elderberries are smaller than a pea. Um, I'll show you, if you wanna put it back on me, I'll show you that. Can you see that? That's an elderberry. That's one elderberry. They are super tiny. Um, they taste, when they're dried, they kind of taste like a raisin. Very, very tasty. Um, elderberries are extremely safe. They are, um, uh, you know, I, I've eaten elderberry pie before. I've drank elderberry juice. Um, and they're very safe. They are also extremely antiviral. So that's why they're wonderful, even, you know, very good for kids. When you make elderberry elixir, you always add honey and you should never give honey to a child under the age of one. So, um, well, if, if you can't see, sorry, I'm seeing people say that they can't see the, the visual like of the elderberry. And if you can't, you can always Google what an elderberry looks like. Okay. Um, the scientific name is Sambucus. 
uh, S-A-M-B-U-C-U-S, and that's another way you can find a lot of really good photos of them online. Um, but we talked about fire cider, now elderberry elixir, powerfully antiviral, um, boosts your immune system so that you can fight these viruses off, okay? Um, now there was some concern, and I'm sure all of you have heard about it. Um, one of the issues that a lot of people are facing with COVID-19 is what they call a cytokine or a cytokine storm, okay? Now we need cytokines, okay? That's actually what helps us to fight off, um, to fight off viruses, okay? However, sometimes people will overproduce these cytokines and their liver will have to work too hard, okay? And um, there was some fear for a little while that elderberry would boost your immune, immune system too much, cause too many of these cytokines to build up and cause what they call a cytokine storm, okay? And that it would cause your liver to shut down. The thing is, is and, and I've talked to over a thousand other plant um, people about this, herbalists, um, uh, traditional medicine people, knowledge holders, I've talked to them about this and all of them. I haven't had a single herbalist tell me that they believe that um, elderberry will cause a cytokine storm. There just isn't any good evidence. There was one study done with 12 people that said, and all it said was that elderberry does indeed boost cytokines. Okay, that's true. But it does not cause a cytokine storm. If anything, we have found in a lot of research that elderberry will modulate cytokines, okay? So it will produce them when you need them, and then it will um, stop producing them when you have enough or too many, okay? So um, it's really nice to have uh, elderberries around an elderberry elixir. Plus it tastes great. It's very easy to get children to take elderberry elixir. Um, because it's a, um, it's a combination of elderberries, honey, and spices, like star anise. Um, actually, Luke, could you grab the star anise off the, I forgot to get it off of there. Sorry. <laughs> um, and I, I don't believe that we have any over here. So star anise is a spice. Um, and it's a cute little star-shaped pod. Thank you. It's convenient that they were in here right now. You guys have probably seen these. They smell like a black jelly bean, okay? Um, these are actually, someone got these for me at the nat natural grocer. So do you see kind of how to spell it there? Star anise or star anise? These are really wonderful. And if you do not have elderberries, Elderberries are almost impossible to find right now, okay? Because people are um, hoarding and people are scrambling to make traditional medicine. And so they're going on all of these herbal websites um, and instead of being respectful and trying to leave some so that everyone can have access and especially so that indigenous people can have access to these traditional medicines, they're um, over purchasing and hoarding them. Um, so if you cannot get a hold of elderberries right now, um, get a hold of some star anise. I guarantee you could probably find them at your local grocery store. Um, even in the tiny town of Mobridge, South Dakota, they have little packets of star anise, okay? It's, um, I think people even use them like for ornaments and stuff like that and for craft projects. Um, but it is, uh, this actually um, is what Tamiflu, Tamiflu is um, an antiviral prescription drug and um, it is made from star anise. So the active ingredient in Tamiflu comes from a plant. That's ethnobotany. Um, <laughs> and that's food sovereignty. And that's food is medicine, right? Because you can even throw a couple of these star pods in a pot of rice when you make them. And it'll flavor the rice beautifully. And so you'll actually be eating antiviral rice. Um, <laughs> because this is a very powerful antiviral medicine. Now, when I make my elderberry elixir, I throw star anise pods into my elderberry elixir. I also add ginger, I add cinnamon, and I add clove. All wonderfully antiviral spices, 
Okay, so you can see elderberry elixir is a not just a fantastic medicine, it's also a wonderful food. Now, while we're on the subject of elderberry elixir, let me say something about its use um, for cough. Because I do use elderberry elixir for cough. In fact, I'll put a little bit of a uh, little jar of elderberry elixir next to my kids' beds with a spoon. And if they wake up coughing in the middle of the night when they get sick, they just take a spoonful of elderberry elixir and go back to sleep. Um, a lot of people for cough try to turn to over the counter cough syrups. Over the counter cough syrups almost always have a compound, um, uh, a, a medicine in them called dextromethorphan, right? It's sometimes sold under things like Robitussin DM or um, uh, you know other cough medicines, DM or DX or DXM. Uh, that's dextromethorphan. Dextromethorphan, why does it work? Okay, ask yourself that. Why does over-the-counter cough syrup work? The most common answer I get as a teacher People say, well, the cough medicine soothes your throat so that you don't have to cough. And that's completely untrue. Um, uh, dextromethorphan is actually, a, it's called a disassociative. It's a, it's a hallucinogen that actually acts on your brain and makes you think that you don't have to cough. Right? It's crazy. People, we used to give it to kids. I even remember when I was little, people were giving dextromethorphan to kids. It's a disassociative. It actually um, lessens your ability to feel emotion. So p some people even use it as a street drug to get high. Um, do not give over-the-counter cough medicine to your kids, please. If you learn nothing else from me today, I ask you not to give over-the-counter cough medicine to your kids. Because here's the thing. In clinical trials all over the world, they've shown that plain honey works better to treat cough than over-the-counter cough medicine in clinical trials. So can you imagine if you're making your own cough medicine with star anise and cinnamon and clove and elderberries and honey, right? Not only are you fighting the virus with all those beautiful antiviral herbs, you're also helping to control the cough so that you can get a good night's rest with the honey and, and the antivirals, okay? And, and you know, the, the fact is your body wants you to cough for a reason, okay? Um, uh, sometimes it's to get stuff out, but um, all these antivirals and the honey will also help to make your cough more productive. But if um, you have a bunch of stuff stuck in your lungs, you can refer back to the fire cider that I was talking about to thin the mucus. You can use the fire cider and the elderberry elixir in conjunction with each other to really create something beautiful. And um, uh, you know, do a shot of fire cider, do a shot of elderberry elixir, and um, those two medicines right there um, will really be amazing and a great combination in fighting viral illnesses. Okay. So um, a lot of people, I wanted to talk about um, a few other things. A lot of people are um, talking about smudging as a way to kill um, microbes, okay? As a way to kill airborne bacteria, as a way to destroy viruses. Okay, there has been research that certain types of sage, now I'm saying that in English, but let me clarify in a second. Certain types of sage are indeed antiviral and they are antimicrobial, right? So they will kill bacteria. There's been a lot of research to show that. And a lot of research has shown that the smoke from sage being burned in the air, not being inhaled, but being burned in the air, will actually um, even uh, kill bacteria on surfaces, okay? Or in softer surfaces like blankets and, and beds and things like that and couches. So that's fantastic, but please, okay? Do not go out and start harvesting sacred medicines for indigenous people, and number one, unless you're indigenous, number two, unless you intend on giving it to an indigenous person, and number three, unless you follow the protocols put in place by your ancestors, the people who came before you, I can't stress that enough, follow the protocols. Um, but I'm asking you, if you're not native, there's no reason for you to go out and harvest um, traditional medicines on occupied lands. There's just no reason for it. Because while sage, as I was saying, this is Artemisia ludoviciana, 
um, we call it ceremonial sage around here. This is what we burn and we smudge with. Um, very antimicrobial and even found to be antiviral, um, but easily over harvested. Okay, so this is what we use around here. Um, a lot of people, when they hear sage and smudging, I, I'm, I'm actually afraid to show this, but I, I want to, to clarify. This is California white sage. This is um, salvia apiana, okay? This only grows in California. People are going all over and over harvesting it, and it's becoming an endangered plant. And now a lot of indigenous people in that area who need this for their ceremonies are not going to have as much access to it um, because people are over harvesting it because they think that they're going to burn it and destroy um, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. No. In fact, this species of, um, you know, this type of sage, we're calling it sage, and this type of sage, right? They actually have very similar antiviral, antimicrobial properties as rosemary. Just plain rosemary right from the grocery store. You do not have to steal sage from indigenous people. You do not have to buy it. <laughs> you can just go to the grocery store and get rosemary. Burn rosemary. Smudge with rosemary. Put rosemary in your soup put rosemary in your you know salads okay I know uh, a lot of places where it grows uh, they use it as an ornamental in people's lawns and things like that um, dry some rosemary and burn that it is just as antimicrobial as um, as our the sage that's so important for indigenous people so there's no reason to go out and harvest other people's sacred medicines there's a lot of beautiful uh, medicines that have their origins in in Europe um, that are very useful and that have found their way over here to North what's now called North America and South America okay so so please and and for goodness sake you know don't don't buy <laughs> I, I, I I'm sure you guys heard about um, not long ago um, Urban Outfitters or some horrible company like that was selling little shells with sage in them. Never buy things like that, please. It's horribly exploitative. It's hard on the plant, and it's even harder on the people who rely on those plants. So, so don't go there, okay? Um, especially when you have something just as useful that's plentiful and easy to grow like rosemary, okay? Um, now, on that subject of rosemary, and on the subject even of culinary sage, right? Um, not, not the salvia apiana that grows in California that's becoming endangered, but um, culinary sage, the stuff you put in your stuffing or sausage, um, you can actually use a lot of those spice, spices. They are very antiviral. If you don't have access to a herb shop, if you um, uh, only have some spices in your spice cabinet and you don't want to go off to the grocery store, here's what I urge you to do. Food is medicine, right? Make a medicinal soup to boost your immune system. Um, first of all, this is some chicken bone broth that my family made. Um, a lot of people make bone broth with bison or bone broth with beef bones, organic beef bones. Um, we had some organic chickens and so we made um, organic chicken stock, um, chicken bone broth. And um, it's fantastic, it's delicious, it's a wonderful culinary ingredient. Um, imagine a soup, okay, I'm just gonna go here. Organic uh, chicken bone broth, organic beautiful wild rice that we harvested, or whatever kind of rice your people use, or whatever complex carbohydrate your people use. Here in the Dakotas, maybe we would use breadroot, okay? I don't have any with me right now, um, and I didn't plan on talking about it, but maybe we would use breadroot in with our uh, chicken bone broth. So chicken bone broth, whatever complex carbohydrate is important to your people, and then some spices like rosemary, the antiviral rosemary, like the antiviral oregano. Oregano, just simple oregano gorgeously antiviral. Um, add some thyme in there too, T-H-Y-M-E, right? <laughs> we can never have enough thyme. Um, thyme is also antiviral. Add some garlic in there. 
add some sliced ginger root in there, add some onions in there, and throw in a few spicy chilies. Oh my gosh, right? That sounds so delicious to me. Um, cut up some chicken in there if you want to. It doesn't, ma it doesn't matter um, if you eat that. But, um, you know, that's right there. That's a medicinal soup, okay? You might just think of it as soup. <laughs> but there's a lot of antiviral medicines and even antibacterial medicines uh, that will keep your lungs and your immune system healthy in that one soup, right? Um, so food is medicine. Take that seriously. Eat the things you're supposed to be eating and you won't get sick, right? Um, or you'll be a lot less likely to get sick or your body will be able to fight off those illnesses a lot more effectively if you do get them, okay? So medicinal soup. Another thing that I, I love to add, I always love to add traditional foods to anything that I am eating. And so, you know, you could even add, um, one of my friends made uh, some gorgeous traditional um, hominy that's dried corn. Uh, you can add that to your soups. Um, and that's actually uh, a, a really good complex carbohydrate. Um, but Another thing that I use to boost my immune system, um, my whole family eats fermented foods, okay? So we were talking a little bit ago about fire cider, and vinegar is a wonderful fermented product that will help boost your immune system. But there's a lot of other products and ways to boost your immune system with fermented foods, okay? Um, I always, I'm, I'm part Asian, my mom is half Mongolian and half Korean, and I eat a lot of kimchi. Now, this kimchi is a medicine as well as being a gorgeous food, okay? So not only is this a fermented product with tons of beautiful um, lactobacillus bacteria in it that keeps your gut healthy, if you have a healthy gut, you will have a boosted immune system, okay? If you have a good, healthy gut, if you're eating the things you're supposed to be eating, the things um, that will promote a good gut microbiome. Have you guys heard that phrase before? Gut microbiome. That means you are creating a home that these healthy bacteria will be happy in, okay? When you eat things like refined sugar, when you eat pasta, which is made of refined flour, when you eat fry bread, when you eat, um, you know, uh, a lot of processed foods that are high in sugar and high in sodium, you are killing the good bacteria in your gut. So have you ever wondered why you have issues in the bathroom? Okay. Or maybe why you get sick often, or maybe why you get a sick or queasy feeling after you eat? Refined sugar, refined flour, and dairy will lower and kill your immune system just as they will kill the good bacteria in your gut, okay? Try to avoid those foods right now if you can, those refined sugars, refined flour, dairy, um, avoid alcohol, okay? Those things destroy your immune system, okay? Even just getting rid of those things or limiting those things in your diet uh, can really help to, to boost your immune system. Add some fermented foods to that, like kimchi, and you're going to be even better off. Like I said, this isn't um, just a fermented product, right? Because I'm getting all that beautiful lactobacillus, those, those good bacteria from the kimchi, but there's also hot chilies in here. There's also garlic in here. There's also ginger in here and onions that help to keep my lungs healthy, right? So I'm getting so many good things from this kimchi. Um, if you don't like kimchi, if you don't like spicy stuff, uh, just make some sauerkraut, right? I've posted many sauerkraut recipes on my um, Facebook page, but sauerkraut is just salt and cabbage. That's all it is, okay? Everyone gets so intimidated by, by cooking these days, right? Because we live in, in um, places where, where we haven't had to cook in so long that people have forgotten how to do it. Don't be afraid of it. Um, and, and the truth is the powers that be, the military industrial complex, uh, the military agricultural complex, they want us to be afraid, 
of cooking our own food. They want us to be afraid of growing our own food. They want us to feel intimidated by it. Um, whereas, you know, the, the fact is, it's growing your own food is as easy as planting a seed, watering it, and putting it in the sun, okay? Um, cooking is as easy as chopping up a cabbage and putting salt on it. That'll make sauerkraut in about two weeks, okay? And sauerkraut has beautiful, gorgeous, good bacteria that's also good for your gut. Now, I prefer the garlic and the onions and the chilies in there because they're so also so good for your immune system. But if you um, have issues with those, just make some sauerkraut, okay? Those fermented foods are wonderful. Now, a lot of people also drink kombucha. That's the fermented tea. I'm personally not a fan. I don't know. Um, I'll drink vinegar, but I'm not a big fan of kombucha. Uh, but, but kombucha does have some probiotics, right? Probiotics, you've probably heard of that. That's those good gut bacteria I'm talking about. Um, so, so it does have some good gut bacteria in it, uh, but not as much as kimchi or sauerkraut, right? So, which is why I like them. Um, you can also buy lacto-fermented pickles, right? That's pickles that are fermented without the use of sugar or vinegar, right? Vinegar actually in vinegar is a, is a wonderful, um, uh, immune booster, but if you put it in kimchi or sauerkraut, it'll actually kill the, the good bacteria you're trying to grow. So, um, you don't want to do that. Uh, but there's a lot of fermented products, fermented foods that, that you can, um, look up recipes for. You can even ferment fruit these days just by, uh, you know, salted pineapple is delicious. Fermented pineapple. Oh my gosh. It's gorgeous. Um, and it has lots of good, uh, gut bacteria probiotics as well. Okay. So I really urge you to think about, um, that I, um, I was telling, uh, you guys earlier that I was out harvesting ramps yesterday and, um, you know, those gorgeous wild leeks. And um, what I do is I actually pickle them in my own home homemade fermented soy sauce, okay? And so that makes these ramp pickles uh, pickled in soy sauce, um, and they're gorgeous and have lots of good bacteria. And I can send you guys a recipe for that if you want them. Let me know. They're wonderful. Just have them with rice. Um, just have them by themselves. They're kind of addictive. Um, so that's another fermented product. Um, a lot, I'm using a lot of teas right now to help people boost their immune system and stay healthy. One way to do that, and um, just another really quick story. Um, how, how am I doing on time? Okay, I'm gonna stop and let you guys ask questions in a little bit, but I wanna go over some of the teas that I've been using and, and um, uh, with the people that I'm working with. Um, I was working with a cardiologist a long time ago and um, he actually, uh, well, he, he actually approached me and he, he told me why would anybody want to drink tea when they could just take a pill? He was perplexed. He had no idea why anyone would want to drink tea um, and he was like, you don't even know what's in the tea. You know, you could have, you could have, there could be dirt in there. Whereas when you're taking a pill, you know exactly what's in there, which is completely untrue, right? <laughs> but after talking to him, um, I got him to understand, and he actually started doing research on vitamin C and its use in boosting the immune system and preventing infection, okay? Um, I urge you to be drinking or eating lots of vitamin C right now. Have you guys seen the research on vitamin C um, and its use in treating COVID-19. There's some actually some really beautiful research about it. Um, and there was actually a couple of government agencies that was that were trying to suppress the research into vitamin C. Um, I just think it's too cheap and too simple. And they didn't want people using something that was inexpensive and easy and well, free. Um, because you can go out and harvest your own rose hips. Rose hips are the berries on the rose bush. Desiree, if you have a picture of rose hips or of a wild rose, you could put those up if you want. Um, but uh, rose hips are the berry that grows on the rose bush. This is a dried rose hip. Crunchy because it's super dried. Tastes like a cross between a cranberry and an apple. 
incredibly high in vitamin C. Three little rose hips have as much vitamin C as a grapefruit. And a lot of citrus actually doesn't have as much vitamin C as you think. Um, rose hips have tons of vitamin C. Chickweed has vitamin C uh, and zinc. Um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of herbs have more vitamin C than citrus, including rose hips. Rose hip tea is wonderful. It's tasty. Kids love it. You can add some honey to it. Um, it's even good uh, 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 in muffins. You know, you can cook up and soften these rose hips and make some muffins for your kids if you want. And you're getting medicinal muffins for them, right? Um, I think that's super cool. Um, but boosting your immune system with vitamin C right now, even if it's just a supplement. I'm not a fan of supplements. I'd rather get, get my um, medicine from plants. But if that's what you have access to, a vitamin C supplement right now um, is really good. Uh, if you can't get your kid to drink rose hip tea, look for a vitamin C gummy if you have to, okay? There's no shaming here, right? We don't allow food shaming or medicine shaming here because frankly, a lot of us as native people, we have um, been so displaced that we don't have access to our traditional medicines. And that's okay. Don't let ever let anyone tell you um, that it's not. If you can, if you want to, um, if you, and, you know, if you have ways to ha get access to these traditional medicines, by all means do that. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are alternatives as well. So vitamin C, really good. Rose hips full of vitamin C. Tasty. You can eat them. You can drink them. Okay. Another tea that I'm using a lot is actually, I just, I want to show you guys this huge jar. <laughs> this was full at the beginning of COVID-19. Okay. Um, this is bee balm, also known as Monarda, also known as wild bergamot. And I think actually that Desiree has Desiree a picture has that she could put, she up. Could put up. This is a member of the mint family. And if you smell it, you'll actually find that it smells a lot like Listerine. Okay. And that's because actually Listerine, the mouthwash was originally made from bee balm. Okay, um, let me show you. Here's one of the dried, gorgeous dried flowers. Like I said, it's a member of the mint family and it has a beautiful pinkish, purplish flower up at the top and a gorgeous smell um, that to me smells very clean um, and minty. Um, it smells a lot like oregano. You can use it as an oregano substitute. So imagine that if you put bee balm in your spaghetti sauce or in your pizza sauce, um, you would have an antimicrobial pizza sauce, which I think is pretty freaking cool <laughs> um, uh, and delicious too. So, um, but it makes a wonderful tea, makes a wonderful mouthwash, but it is also very antibacterial um, and, and it will help you fight off uh, bacterial lung infections, which, which we're seeing a lot of right now. Okay. So that's the bee balm. Um, I'm using also my friend, um, spring. She has a company called Sakari Botanicals and she sent me a lot of cedar. Um, this is, um, red cedar. Okay. And I, I believe Desiree that you probably have a picture of cedar as well. I, I drink cedar as a tea. Now, let me just say, because in case we have someone here um, from uh, Saskatchewan and, and Northern Alberta, I've actually had a lot of friends who do not drink cedar tea. In fact, their people feel it's dangerous. My people have been drinking cedar tea for millennia, and I still do it. Um, when I was living in Ojibwe country, they drank cedar tea every day with some honey in it um, or some maple syrup in it. Um, uh, so a lot of people do use cedar as a tea, but some people don't. Again, follow the protocols put in place by the people who came before you, okay? Listen to their advice. Because if you're a member of one of those tribes that doesn't use cedar as a tea, there's probably a reason why for your, for your people. Um, but cedar is um, wonderful as a tea, helps to thin mucus, helps to boost the immune system, helps with coughing as well, um, helps with sinus issues. Um, helps to keep your immune system strong. I love cedar tea. The, um, the other thing that I use cedar for is that I make a chest balm, okay? So like I make my own homemade Vicks Vapor Rub. So I actually use this as lip balm too sometimes. <laughs> it's awesome stuff. This um, chest balm actually has eucalyptus, 
cedar and rosemary in it. There's rosemary again, right? So it's very antiviral um, and antibacterial. So if you use it as a lip balm, you're getting a little bit of that medicine all day, okay? Um, but it also has um, those wonderful oils in it. Um, I use the, the plants, but the oils came out of the plants. Um, and uh, it helps to thin mucus just yes. like six yes. around yes. that. Okay. Um, so we talked about the cedar. Oh, the cedar, you can also actually, so not only can you drink cedar tea, you can also use it as the chest balm, but you can also do um, what, what I, I call a, a breathing treatment using cedar. And that is you boil cedar in a pot, okay? Maybe you'll also drink that as a tea afterward, but you boil the cedar in a pot, put a towel over your head. Some people call this tenting, okay? Making a little tent over the pot. Make sure you don't catch the towel on fire, okay? Um, and you breathe in the steam from that cedar tea. Breathe it in deeply through your nostrils. It's wonderful for your sinuses, wonderful for your throat, wonderful for your lungs, okay? Now, what other plants do I use for steam? I have a plant called curly cup gumweed in English. Grindelia is part of the scientific name, Grindelia squarosa. Desiree, can you put that picture up for me? And I'll show you what it looks like dried in my cute little jar here as well. Grindelia squarosa has a beautiful little yellow flower. And the other thing about it is that it is incredibly resinous. Even this, you can kind of see there, is still very sticky, even though it's been dried since last year, okay? That's why it's called gum weed, right? Curly cup gum weed, right? The, that gorgeous resin in there, mm, I love that smell. Um, it's, it also has a really clean sort of cedar-like smell, and um, I use that for a steam as well. So sometimes I'll mix my cedar and my curly cup gum weed in the pot of water, and um, I'll put a towel over and I'll inhale that really deeply. It even helps with my asthma. Um, the other thing about that is, is that you can totally drink that as a tea afterward, that cedar curly cup gumweed tea, gorgeous. Um, very good for boosting your, your immune system and keeping your lungs healthy, okay? Um, oh, swamp tea, two, two more. I'll talk about two more and then I'll take some questions. Um, oh, maybe three more. <laughs> I could talk about this stuff all day in case you guys can't tell. This is swamp tea, okay? And I believe that Desiree also has a picture of this when it's growing. Um, I got this, I harvested this up in Wisconsin, I believe. You can see that one side of those beautiful kind of thick leaves are bright green, okay? But the other side is like a powdery, fuzzy, rusty red color, okay? Um, gorgeous flavor. One of my favorite teas, very good for the lungs. Okay. Really helps with lung function, really helps to keep the little, um, are they called cilia? Uh, the little hairs in your lungs healthy. Okay. Swamp tea to keep, to keep, um, your lungs healthy. Very good stuff. Um, oh, I forgot to talk about cottonwood buds. See those beautiful cottonwood buds? These are the buds off of the cottonwood tree. You can use the buds off of balsam poplar. You can use buds off of poplar. You can use buds off of any kind of cottonwood. Um, and you, you can also uh, make a tea out of those. They're resinous. You can use them for a steam. You can also put those cottonwood buds in your chest balms, okay? Um, so these plants can be used so many different ways. I even use a lot of tinctures. Now tinctures are like super fun, right? They're kind of sexy. This is an ashwagandha tincture. This is not a traditional medicine from the Americas. This is actually sent to me by a friend um, because it's wonderful for boosting the immune system and keeping the lungs healthy. I'll put that up again in case you want to see that. Ashwagandha. Sorry, I kind of hard to read there with the light shining on it, ashwagandha. Um, so a tincture is um, my friend Sunshine Claymore, she's actually my niece, um, made olive leaf tincture, olive leaf 
right? If you live in a warmer climate where you have a lot of olive trees around you, you can actually tincture olive leaves. This is just um, olive leaves and alcohol, right? So some people just use like olive leaves or some plant and vodka because it has to be at least 50% alcohol. But if you avoid alcohol, do not make this kind of tincture. You can make what's called a glycerate instead. Um, and you can, you look up recipes for that. But you know, um, tinctures are fun and kind of sexy because they come in these cute little dropper bottles and you know, you just do six to 10 drops a uh, few times a day. Um, and they sometimes they're great, um, especially, and they're very portable. Uh, whereas it's tough. Um, I used to fly a lot and uh, traveling with a bunch of bags of tea bunch of green plants was not a very good idea. <laughs> so um, I started traveling with tinctures instead and, and they get through security fine. Um, so, um, okay, so I talked about the swamp tea. Oh, the licorice root. So Desiree, if you could put the picture of the wild licorice up, that'd be wonderful. This is glyceriza. Um, this is wild licorice. Um, it is naturally, the root of it is incredibly sweet. In fact, it's being investigated as a sugar substitute, okay? Incredibly sweet tasting root. Um, but licorice was actually used back during the SARS epidemic, okay? Um, it was even used to fight MERS, the Middle Eastern res respiratory virus. So um, very successfully, they were using licorice root Okay, this is my dried licorice root. You can see it's kind of yellowish. It's actually used as yellow dye as well. Um, but they were using licorice root to treat successfully to treat both SARS and MERS. And so a lot of people have been using licorice root. Um, in fact, over in Wuhan province in China, they have been very successfully using licorice root tea to treat, um, to treat COVID-19. Okay, so it's another one that I really highly recommend keeping around and using. Um, it's native, so if you can get out and, and harvest some, that's always really good too. Um, okay, oh, and the last one that I wanted to talk about. Now, just as I was nervous, sorry guys, get comfortable here. Just as I was nervous to talk about the um, California white sage, which I do not want you guys harvesting or picking, um, I'm nervous to talk about this plant, but it's such an important medicinal plant um, and such an important medicine right now, um, especially for uh, lung issues. And, you know, I mean, in case you guys can't tell, COVID-19 destroys the lungs, okay? It destroys the digestive system as well. So it's important to eat good foods, right? And stay, stay healthy. That'll keep your immune system up um, and it'll keep your a digestive system really healthy, but it definitely destroys the lungs. And one of the best plants that I find for lungs right now um, is OSHA, also known as bear root. Okay. And Desiree, I think you have a picture of OSHA or bear root up. Um, it's in the same family as celery um, or parsley, right? Um, we call it the APACA family. So bear root, also known as OSHA, um, bears dig it up. That's why it's called bear root. Uh, this is a really important traditional medicine for so many people. Um, and, and I use it a lot. One of my friends um, who has a herb company called Artemisia Herbs, they actually make OSHA honey. They're very, very sustainable. They harvest it sustainably. But OSHA honey is wonderful in a cup of tea. Um, so if I make swap tea, sometimes I'll put a spoonful of OSHA honey in there and it will help to open up my breathing passages almost immediately. It's really wonderful. It's, um, it has a flavor sometimes that reminds me of mentholatum. Um, so uh, I've noticed that it really helps with breathing, uh, lung support. It strengthens the lungs. Um, so if you have access to bare root, uh, now's a good time to be using it use it sparingly, make sure that you get it from a reputable source, make sure it is sustainably harvested, okay? So um, those are most of the plants that I'm going to talk about today. Um, I uh, am happy to take questions. I, I did actually wanna say one thing that um, I forgot. Uh, I have an outline, but I haven't exactly been following it. Um, when I talk about making tea, um, there's really, 
you know, uh, no standard way to make tea. Um, everyone makes their tea a little bit differently, but most people who work with plants recognize that you have at least two types, a decoction or an infusion, okay? A decoction is a tea made from tough plant parts. When I say tough plant parts, I mean like roots and big heavy seeds and bark, okay? So like if I'm making licorice root tea, see those chunks of the root? I really need to get the medicine out of that root, so I make a decoction. And a decoction is where you actually take the plant material and you boil it, you cook it, to pull the medicine out of the plant. That's a decoction, okay? It's a tea made from tough plant parts, and it needs to actually be cooked and boiled for about 10 minutes to get the medicine out, okay? Now, if I'm making an infusion, okay? An infusion is made from softer plant parts. Maybe it's the flowers, maybe it's the leaves, maybe it's like just the, the stamens or the, pis, the, the pistils in the um, thing. Remember the swamp tea? That's a pretty soft, soft little leaf there. If I'm doing this, I'm just making an infusion. And that's where you take these softer plant parts and you put them in hot water and you let them steep for about 10 to 15 minutes, okay? Decoction or infusion. That's really important um, to important info to think about. Okay. All right. So I'm happy to take some questions right now. Um, do you guys, uh, let's see, let me look on here and see if there's any questions already. Desiree, have there been any questions yet? I'm, I don't know if people want to put them in the chat. Yeah, so right now, um, folks are able to unmute themselves if they want to do popcorn style Q&A with Linda. No question? I have, I have a question. I have a question. Um, first of all, thank you so much for offering this, this information. I really, um, really appreciate it. Um, and for all of your knowledge, I am grateful. I was, um, I was wondering about sage and how, uh, understandably, we shouldn't be going out harvesting um, sage. And where I live, you know, I, I don't know if there, there's any sage, <laughs> but um, I'm wondering, is there a way to just, can we just grow our own sage? Uh, are there ways to get um, that, that California white sage that's becoming extinct? Is it, um, is there a way to, to grow it or something that is as potent as it ourselves, or is that something that we shouldn't uh, do? So actually, um, one of my friends uh, who, he, he writes a lot of papers on ethical wild crafting. Yeah. He says that if you're not, if, um, you know, if you're not indigenous, um, that for every one plant you pick, you should plant five in its place. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm, I'm a big believer in that. I think that that's wonderful. And I, I actually follow that rule even as an indigenous person. I always try to make sure that like, so for, for example, um, you know, I collected ramps yesterday. I harvested them sustainably. I don't take the bulb or the root, um, but I, I do take some of the bulbs and I actually transplant them to other places so, um, so that I can spread it out and expand its range in a good way. Um, but absolutely, you can buy seeds or even um, rootstock from uh, certain species of sage. And, you know, like let's say you bought five of them, put one or two in your yard and plant the other three out in the wild. There's a lot of places that are actually doing that mm -hmm. um, so that people can um, help to replant these in their um, traditional range. Um, the Artemisia ludoviciana that we use here in the Dakotas, this actually, the range of it, um, it grows as far east as Virginia. So, um, and it grows up into Canada and down south into Texas and um, very far out west. Um, I found it in um, the eastern part of Washington state. So, you know, it has a huge range. And so it's always great to, to, um, throw some of the seeds around. Sometimes um, what I'll do is uh, if I get some that has seeds on it, like if, if someone give, gifts me some that has the seeds, I'll separate the seeds and save them and just go 
throw them outside wherever I can. So yeah, thank you for asking that. That's a great question. Um, uh, one of my friends, because he, um, he actually used to live in the Dakotas, didn't have access to sage when he moved to Ohio. So he just took some rootstock from here, you know, took, took just a handful of rootstock, took it back to Ohio, and now he has a massive patch of sage. It's enough to, to supply him and his entire community in Ohio, the, the native community um, there. So I think it's a great idea. And, and you know, there are a lot, like you could grow, as I was saying earlier, rosemary as well. Um, put a rosemary plant in, and that's just as antimicrobial as the sage. You can burn that. You can make a tea out of it. Um, it's, it's, you know, good stuff. Just put it in your soups and um, sauces and things like that, and you'll still be getting the medicine from it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I guess. No, I could, I could probably talk about more if there's, <laughs> if there aren't questions. <laughs> Keep it coming. Linda, this is Jolie Sasakamus. I have one question. Sorry, I'm not on video. Um, so I typically live on my reserve in northern Saskatchewan in the summer, um, and I forage and harvest and dry and preserve, and then I come back to the city to work. I'm a professor. And this summer, um, you know, it's probably best for me not to go home just because we don't have a health infrastructure. So I was talking to some of my elders and I decided to start helping the elders around the city where I'm living and a lot of them are asking for medicine bundles and packets. So I called my elder and I said, I don't know what to do because I don't want to go to the local reserves and harvest, but uh, what can we do? I said, could I, I try growing hydroponically because I just bought a hydroponic gardening system for myself for like leafy vegetables. And he said, let's have a conference call with the elders and we'll see my girl. And they actually gave me permission to do it. And I'm, but I'm scared because it's so sacred. And I, I really didn't think they'd give me permission. I thought they would tell me I was just a crazy youngster, but they really are. They said they're going to let me do it. And so I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there because I'm scared at the same time. Yep. And, and, you know, I, I really appreciate you saying that. So I, this is totally just me. I'm going to throw out my thoughts on this. Um, and again, I want to reiterate that, that when I talk up to you guys about these, about these relatives, that is literally like when I go out, I talk to them as brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles, grandparents. Okay. So, um, so I, I understand just how the, the weight of that, um, and, and how, what a big deal that is. But I, I'm also, I, I consider myself a native scientist. I don't necessarily consider myself a Western scientist, even though I have that training. Um, and as a native scientist, what I have seen is that um, over the decades that I've been teaching, and, and you might have witnessed this too as a professor, science has changed, Na native science has changed, right? So if we look at Western science, science right? There is this lady, uh, a lot of you guys have heard from her, uh, heard of her, her name's Jane Goodall, right? And she was really respected as a primatologist, as a, as a scientist. She went out and she worked with chimpanzees and other primates and she just sat with them and she um, got to know them and she lived with them and she wrote down her observations published them and bam, you know, she's considered this amazing scientist. Her research would not fly at all these days, right? People would laugh her out of the ivory tower um, <laughs> these days because that research wouldn't fly. Western science has become extremely quantitative. They want to see data. Um, they want to see the numbers, okay? Native science has actually moved in somewhat of a quantitative direction as well. And, and, and not the same, not in the same vein as, as Western science, right? Native science is like, okay, let's try these new things. We, we have this world that has changed. We have, you know, issues like climate change that we have to deal with. We have degraded soil that we have to deal with. You know, we, we have a lot of things that colonization has, has changed our world. So how can we use, um, these new technologies in order to like really forward our, um, our needs as indigenous people. And so um, I, I absolutely, I do tons of research in aquaponics and hydroponics. 
all the time. I, I have some mint growing right now. Mint is very important here. Um, mentha arvensis, a wild mint, super important. And I am growing tons of it hydroponically. And elders are fascinated, but they're also really happy because it's, it's getting hard to find. The other thing is, is that the wild mint that we go out and harvest sometimes is not growing. It grows in like these sewage ditches now. And no one's going to want to be drinking mint tea that's growing in a sewage ditch. So, um, so you know, it's, it's hard to find in good spots right now. Whereas, you know, where uh, the way that I'm growing it is extremely clean. Um, I make sure to keep the water extremely clean and I use filtered water and um, it's a lot of fun. So, and not only that, I'm doing, uh, you know, the, the pairing like with the fish and um, I have some with fish and some without. So, you know, that's always fun too and, and good information. So, I, I just wanted to throw that out there too, just to say that I'm with you and, and that um, a lot of people, uh, you know, try to like, I, I've actually done research on why traditional medicines work. So um, like an elder used to tell me um, that you have to harvest sand cherries from downwind, otherwise they'll smell you coming and they'll turn <laughs> bitter. And as a scientist, people laugh at that. Oh, they smell you coming. but in the research that I did, we actually found out that um, uh, sand cherries have these stomata that open up. They're like breathing pores and they take in um, the pheromones of animals and they'll start producing bitter alkaloids. They'll, they'll turn themselves bitter. They will smell you coming literally and turn themselves bitter. And I, that was a research project that I did to, to show that. Um, I don't mind proving those things. I don't mind proving that like our traditional knowledge is badass, you know? Um, and so I just, I just wanted to say that, you know, what an awesome way to provide for your elders in the city without exposing your um, res to possible illness right now. I, I Thank just, you so much. Like, I feel like crying right now because it's been weighing on me and I really just thank you for this workshop. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you and I'm with you. I totally understand. So. <laughs> okay. Before I get emotional. <laughs> um. So we do have one question from the um, chat, which is from Anitra Brooks. I live in Connecticut and mint in our community garden is considered invasive. I still grow it anyways. Is there a certain type of mint that is more beneficial? So the mint family is huge, and um, and and the thing is, is like lemon balm, for for example, is a type of mint that is being used to fight COVID nineteen. I I didn't even talk about lemon balm. I I have some. Um, I should have showed you guys. Um, it's the mint with the lemony smell, and um, it's it's very antiviral and it's very good for lung support. Um, and it's also good for digestion. So it's like a triple whammy of good things. Um, but spearmint, peppermint. Bee balm, again, is a type of mint. Mm -hmm. um, for me, you know, people, like, what's a weed, right? A weed is just a, probably a beneficial plant that's growing where people don't want it to grow. I find that people get very frustrated with mint for that reason. So if it is um, considered invasive, dig it up from those areas and just transplant, transplant it somewhere else where people won't mind it. Um, cracks of the sidewalk or wherever that might be, um, you know, cause mint will grow anywhere. And I, I love that. I love the fact that it'll spread out. And um, uh, I can't say they, they all have different properties and I can't say that one is more beneficial than the other because they, they're just used for different things. So absolutely though, um, mint is very important. And um, you know, if you had tons of it, you could totally send it, like for instance, here to the res or, or you know, maybe um, one of the other folks who are on need it for their res um, because I'm mixing right now, I'm mixing mint with hawthorne berry and sending it to all the elders. Number one, that keeps them strong. And number two, it's very good lung support. Um, most of the mints are good lung support, but it also helps with digestion. So they love it um, and it tastes great. So um, yeah, keep on growing that mint. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Um, 
Okay, I see Jill. Um, I see your question about ramps and mushrooms. You can definitely grow mushrooms. Um, you can buy kits online to grow mushrooms hydroponically. And and I didn't even talk about mushrooms today. Um, of course, mushrooms aren't plants, but I use a lot of medicinal mushrooms like reishi and lion's mane and shiitake. Um, I, I love them. Um, I use them a lot actually in opioid addiction, um, helping people to. Um, through recovery um, and you can grow them you can buy kits to grow them you can even buy what they call the inoculum um, and you can inoculate your own logs and grow them outside um, it's it's a trial and error process kind of like gardening you know people are afraid of gardening because they're afraid they're gonna screw up but even master gardeners will tell you that every year is different and it's the same way with growing mushrooms you can grow ramps as well, um, but it's a different type of, uh, it's, it's usually not Allium trichocum. It's uh, a different type of wild uh, leek. Um, but I have a friend who transplanted them to the woods, who transplanted a bundle of ramps last year to the woods behind his house, and the patch was twice as big this year. So you can definitely grow them if you have the right conditions. They love the shade. They grow in the woods. Any other questions? Um, so Desiree asked me to give, and, and I'm totally fine taking more questions. My, um, Desiree asked me to give my contact information. I'm gonna give you my email um, right now. And, and um, I, uh, if you guys have ways to spread this around, or if you have not seen the posts on my Facebook, um, my partner and I have been making kits for the elderly, food kits in which we're putting things like traditional foods, um, dried corn, dried beans, um, maple syrup, maple sugar, um, uh, wild rice, um, you know, dried berries and all kinds of, oh, we're putting the tea that I was talking about, the Hawthorne mint tea. Um, we're putting nettles, we're putting dried meat, we're putting lacto-fermented pickles into these huge kits. It's actually a month worth of, a month's worth of food for two people um, into these 18 gallon totes and we're taking them uh, to the reservations in North and South Dakota. Um, we're serving a 7,000 square mile area and it's just the two of us um, operating out of our apartment to do this. But um, if you are interested in supporting that, you can PayPal me at lynda.black.elk at gmail.com. That's my email. Also, if you have any questions, feel free to email me uh, there and I'm happy to answer any questions. I know sometimes it's hard to ask questions um, on this, you know, on the webinar. So if you have questions that you want to email me, please do that. Or if you want to support that project, that's the email you use for PayPal. Okay, I can take more questions or um, I can go eat my birthday cake. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, I'm going to take us back over to Brooke here um, to see if there's anything that she wanted to contribute before we wrap up. Um, I just, um, wanted, I just to wanted to thank, to thank everybody. You. You know, thank you, thank Ibex Puppetry, Heather Henson, Brenna, and of course, Linda, uh, you know, happy birthday. You are amazing. You have inspired me to even work harder for this program. You know, you just are like this, you have a spirit in you that you, I want to work and, and make sure that, you know, these things are getting to, to Native communities and that, you know, your suppliers are getting um, put forward through. So. I'm definitely going to make sure that we really, really, really get you those donations that you need to take care of those elders and to take care of our communities. And I just can't thank you enough. Um, just, just some things that I just want people to be aware of. With this is just a side, you know, side note about the invasive species. We have to understand that invasive species sometimes can wipe out geographically. Uh, native species of plants. So when somebody tells you that, they're telling you that for a reason. So what winds up happening is that a lot of invasive species don't have natural, I don't want to call them predators because plants really, I mean, everything picks on plants. But what happens is that 
different bacteria or fungus or different plant diseases or different beetles may not be accustomed to those plants. So what winds up happening is that they have no, no, nothing to knock it out and they wind up growing like crazy and taking up space for traditional plants that wouldn't really be able to compete with them basically being really good growers. So when we're talking about invasive species, that's why we wanna be careful because just like with animals, plants and fungus have a relationship that's created over time. So if you throw in a new, a new community into that mix, you can offset the balance. So I just wanna make sure that when people are doing uh, gorilla seeding or let's say replanting indigenous plants, that they're making sure that they're from the territories that they're from and they're not like mixing things. Um, also, just a really quick disclaimer, foraging and to get, Linda is amazing, right? So, but it's taken her, I'm sure, a quite a journey. And so I want people to make, understand that the knowledge that she's given us as, as from natives to natives, we still need to make sure that we have a guide, you know, foraging guides, people who know what they're talking about before we're picking these things because we might pick the wrong thing, you know, and we don't want anybody getting hurt. So just a disclaimer out there, please make sure that you are working with your traditional community members in your territories so that you're not promoting invasive species, so that you're growing things ethically, so that you are safe and healthy and not picking the wrong things or picking them at the wrong time. And then of course, because each plant nation has a spirit, that you're doing things ceremonially and with respect to the plant, because that's why we have our stories. That's why we have our, our song. It all connect back to that. So I just wanted to piggyback off of that a little bit and, and to make sure that people understand where our protocol should be. And just Linda, you are amazing for real. Well, thank you guys so much. I'm so honored to be here with you guys today. Really. So, so happy to spend my birthday with you guys really. So thank you so much for having me on. All right, thank you. I am going to put up the link for next week. It's in the chat if you're on Zoom, uh, but that is at http colon slash slash bit bit dot ly slash first foods two. So if you want to join us next week for these free classes sponsored by Ibex Puppetry, please join us. Um, again, who we have is Isaac Murdoch, um, a Ojibwe uh, storyteller and actually amazing um, artist in his own right, but he is a forager and a traditionalist. So thank you for coming. Thank you for those of you who joined in the classroom on Zoom and we appreciate it. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much.